All right, great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our next. Sorry, that's my dog barking in the background <laughs> for our next Ask a Geologist session. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Rob Shirell, um, professor uh, at Rutgers University. He will tell you a little bit more about his background and he will be talking to us today about conducting some oceanography down in Antarctica. So, Rob, take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I wish we could all be in the same room, but unfortunately we can't, and I wish I could see you, but I can't, so I'm hoping you can see me and everything's working fine. I think probably most of you are in New Jersey. We might have a couple of guests, uh, friends of mine, Guim and Bernat from uh, Caldas de Montbui, which is near Barcelona in Spain. So I think we may have an international audience here today, which I'm really pleased about. So I'm going to be talking to you about Antarctica today. And this is related to geology, but the talk is more about the ocean, which is, of course, part of the Earth. And so it's part of Earth sciences and part of geology is uh, the ocean. So let me see if I can, there we go. Okay, a little bit about me first. Um, I've been a professor for a long time at Rutgers University, almost 28 years. I'm an oceanographer. Uh, my wife is also a scientist, Dr. Storch, and she's a biochemist. And we have two kids who are a little bit older than probably most of you listening, except you parents. They're in their 27 and 29. And they're not scientists, but um, they do interesting things anyway. Now, I wanted to tell you that when I was in high school and even in college, I barely knew what oceanography was. Um, and now I'm a been a full-time professional oceanographer for some time. So it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. When I was in college, I studied chemistry and lots of other things. I've always had lots of interests. <clears throat> so my message there is that things work out in your career and you can go slow and feel your way and change your mind and that's all okay. Uh, by now, I've been on about 30 research cruises on research ships. Uh, I visited all seven continents, which is fantastic privilege. I've been to Antarctica four times, and uh, I have a research group which includes students and technicians and other people, and sometimes those people from my group have gone to Antarctica, uh, let's see, three additional times. So in total, we've been to Antarctica seven times. Uh, always on ships, never to the South Pole. I'll tell you more about that. Other things I like to do, uh, I love to read, but I'm a really slow reader, so I read slowly. I love words, and I like to ride my bike on the other end there. I like to ride as fast as I possibly can. Um, my favorite thing about geology, I would say, apart from what I'm going to talk to you about today, is hydrothermal vents. So I'm not going to talk about that. It's a topic maybe for another time. But you've already heard about volcanoes, and hydrothermal vents are essentially volcanoes that happen at the bottom of the ocean, where seawater circulates into the crust of the earth and comes out as extremely hot water at the bottom of the ocean. All kinds of interesting things happen then. Okay, we're going to start this talk with a little game, and I'm hoping that you will play along. And the question here is, what's the difference between the Antarctic, which is the topic for today, and the Arctic? These are the two different polar regions of the Earth, and they each have different kinds of animals. So the game we're going to play is take these four animals that you see in these four pictures and think about it for a minute. I bet you know most of these, maybe not quite all of them. And think about which ones are animals that are found only in the Arctic, that's in the north of the globe, and which ones are found only in the Antarctic, in the south. So take a couple minutes to think about that, well, a couple seconds. And if you like, you can put your guesses quickly into the chat box, and we'll see how we did. So again, some of these animals are you would have to go from New Jersey, you would have to go north to the Arctic to find, and some of them you would have to go much further south to the Antarctic. 
to find. Okay, have you uh, made up your minds? Let's see how we did. Let's take this one first, the polar bear. Most of us know that. And the polar bear grows only in the Arctic, in the north. I'll show you some maps about where these are in a minute. Let's take another one. How about this one, the walrus? The walrus is also found only in the Arctic. You can't find this in the Antarctic at all, this big mammal. Let's keep going. Penguins. Penguins are only in the Antarctic. These flightless birds do not show up anywhere near the North Pole. They're only in the Antarctic and close to the ocean. And then finally, I don't know if you know what this one is. It looks like a seal, but it looks kind of, like, kind of a mean one, right? And this is a leopard seal. And a leopard seal is only in the Antarctic. And it is a big top predator. So this is a carnivore that eats other animals at the top of the food chain similar to the polar bear. So in the ecology of Antarctica, the, the leopard seal is like the polar bear in Antarctica. Um, and here, this one in particular, this is a mama who's upset because uh, my friend who's taking this picture is getting a little bit too close and this is her pup and she's protecting the pup. And you can see that these are have big teeth and they're very, very big, strong animals. Okay, so how did you do? Did you guess right? Polar bears, walruses in the Arctic, penguins, and leopard seals only in the Antarctic. At the end of the talk, we'll see some other. Okay, so where's the Arctic? We're going to talk about the Antarctic, but first let's go north to the Arctic and make sure you understand where this is on the map. So you can see the Arctic is this whole region at the top of the globe. If you have a globe at home, uh, you can grab it or one of those beach balls that looks like the Earth. That works too. This whole region is called the Arctic region, okay? And in the middle of it sits this green body of water, which is part of the ocean, and that's called the Arctic Ocean. Now here's the Pacific over here, if you can see my cursor, here's the Atlantic, and up at the top of the Earth is the Arctic Ocean. So the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, and right in the middle, the yellow dot, I bet you know what that is, that's the North Pole. So the North Pole is sitting in the middle of the water. Now, most of a good part of the Arctic Ocean, especially in the wintertime, is covered with what we call sea ice. And you can see on the left here, I have sea ice in red and underlined. In case I'm underlining and showing in red words and phrases that might be new to you, and so we can emphasize those and make sure we understand what they are. So sea ice is frozen seawater. It sits, it floats on top of seawater. It's not very thick, maybe as thick as uh, you are tall only, and uh, it floats on the surface of the ocean. Now that's different from glacial ice, and I'm showing here the island of Greenland, a very big island, but it's not big enough to be called a continent. And Greenland is completely covered by a very thick layer of ice called the Greenland ice cap or the Greenland ice sheet. And this is continental ice, ice that's sitting on land, and it can get very, very thick. The ice that floats on the ocean can never get very thick. Okay, so there's a basic difference between glacial ice that sits on land and sea ice that floats on the ocean. Here's New Jersey right down here for those of you who are in New Jersey, those of you who are in Spain or way over there someplace. And let's tilt this globe now and start turning it to the south. And if you have a globe with you, go ahead and do that yourself. Um, and so if we turn a little bit to the south, now New Jersey is up there and Spain is over there. And we're seeing mostly South America. Okay, so we're gonna keep tilting the globe, turning the globe to the south. Keep your eye on the southern tip of South America here. There's the southern tip of South America. And now we see that it's actually pretty close to the northernmost tip of Antarctica. So here's Antarctica. And it's important to remember Antarctica is land, it's a continent. And the South Pole sits almost in the middle of that. Continent. And it's almost a round continent, but it has this funny thumb that sticks up here that seems to get close to the thumb or the, the point of South America. Now, if you wanna to get to Antarctica, the most common way to go is in a ship, and this is the way that I've gone, and where you would go is from here, usually from a town called Punta Arenas in Chile, 
which is in the Straits of Magellan, and you would go out here and then turn south and cross the Drake Passage here, which is one of the stormiest parts of the whole ocean, so it's usually a rough trip on a boat, and arrive here at what's called the Antarctic Peninsula. And that trip, that red line, takes about four days just to get to Antarctica on a ship. Okay, so that's what Antarctica looks like. Now let's look at a little bit more complicated map. What you can see here is the same thing. Here's the Antarctic Peninsula sticking out here, but we got lots of labels here. And what we see is that Antarctica is covered with glacial ice. It's a huge amount of ice. The thickness of ice at the South Pole is right here, is over 3,000 meters. So it's more than two miles thick. This is a huge amount of ice, a huge amount of water. And in fact, it's in terms of bodies of water, frozen water in this case, it's second only to the whole ocean. So it's much, much bigger than all the rivers and all the lakes in all the world all added up. It's a lot of water that sits frozen on this continent. The South Pole, as I said, is right there. But you see other features here. Don't get worried about all the names of things, but can you see mountains? You see where the mountains are represented? Look at this line here. These are mountains. This line that goes through here. This whole mountain ridge is called the Transantarctic Mountains. And the highest one is right here. It's called Vincent Massif. And uh, if you're a mountain climber, you want to climb the highest peaks on all the continents, on each of the seven continents, then you would want to travel to Antarctica and somehow get yourself to Vincent Massif and climb it. One of my teachers in graduate school was one of the team of the first Americans who climbed that peak for the first time in 1966. Now, the other thing you see on this map is ice shelves. So look around and see if you see something that's labeled ice shelf, just like a shelf where you put the books, ice shelf. So do you see it? There's some big ones. For example, this one, the Ronnie Ice Shelf and the Ross Ice Shelf down here. So what ice shelves are is glacial ice that has flowed off of the continent onto the ocean and is now sitting on the seawater and floating on the ocean. So there's ocean underneath this ice and there's ocean underneath this ice. Okay. If you look around the edges of Antarctica, you see that there are ice shelves all around the edges. There's the Amory Ice Shelf, etc. And over here, you can see the Amundsen Sea. The Amundsen Sea is a name for this little bay. You see this little, just kind of like a bay in the coast. And this one gets the name the Amundsen Sea. And there are a bunch of smaller ice shelves all bordering all of the Amundsen Sea. We're going to be talking about the Amundsen Sea. Uh, shortly. So I wanted to point that out and show you uh, where it's located. Um, so remember that an ice shelf is floating ice, but it's not sea ice. It's made from snow that fell on the continent, compressed into ice, and then slowly moved off the continent uh, over the ocean. And there's now a big mass of very thick ice that is floating on the ocean. Now, the other thing you see on this map is all these red dots. Do you see these? These are research stations, and the research stations belong to lots of different countries. You can see the name of the country after each one. And the United States <coughs> has three research stations. This one called Palmer Station, and you can see a picture of it down here. This is the smallest research station that the US runs. And in the summertime, uh, about 40 or 50 scientists and technicians, as well as cooks and engineers and things like that live all together in this cluster of buildings right there. And the other US stations are this one down here called McMurdo, which is much bigger. In the summertime, there might be 1,500 people. It's like a small town living there. And then the last one is in the South Pole, which is uh, an extremely cold place all the time, much, much colder than on the coast. And there's a research station that's maintained there by the United States as well. So the Antarctica doesn't belong to anybody, doesn't belong to any country. The countries have all come together. I think it's 48 countries a number of years ago signed the Antarctic Treaty, 
which agreed to save Antarctica just for research and for peaceful interaction among countries. And that generally, it's a very successful treaty. And so all of these research stations uh, do research in Antarctica and cooperate with each other. Now, if you lift off all of this ice, I told you there's more than two miles thick of ice. So if we were able to magically lift that off of the uh, Antarctic continent and show what's beneath, we would see a bit of a surprise because a lot of this continent actually sits below the level of the ocean surface. It's below sea level. And in this picture, which uh, the colors are meant to show you how deep or how high the land is. So the light blue and the dark blue are below sea level. So all of this area, especially in the western half of Antarctica, is below sea level. If we took the ice off, we would definitely see some continent. Uh, everything in brown and yellow is above sea level. So we would see sort of a big land mass over here, but we would also see a lot of islands. We'd see the Transantarctic Mountains sticking up, but a lot of Antarctica is below sea level. Uh, here's a picture on the lower left of one of the peaks of the Transantarctic Mountains. So you can see it's not all ice because the mountains are tall enough that they stick above the ice in some places. Okay. Now, I said we'd get there on a ship. Uh, this is the... Uh, there, there are two, two main research ships in Antarctica that belong to the U.S., and this is the bigger one. It's also called the Palmer, named after a, a man who was very important in Antarctic uh, discoveries. And this is the Palmer sitting in the water, but why does it look like it's on the land, on ice? It, it's not actually on the land. What you're looking at here is sea ice. So this is a layer of ice that's as thick as maybe... You are taller, maybe as thick as the ceiling in the room you are in, but it's very strong. And so people can get out of the ship and walk on it. But the ship is actually sitting in water and surrounded by seas. Now on the ship, I said we are, we're on the ship for as long as two months at a time. And if you go on a nice cruise ship, like a vacation cruise, I've never been on a vacation cruise because I got on too many cruises for work and uh, it's never interested me that much. But you might have a nice cabin that would look like this with a double bed and a little porch and a view of the sea and some drinks to eat and a nice couch to sit on. And that's not what we see in our research ship. It's much cozier and tighter than that. So here's what a room looks like on a research ship. It's like bunk beds in a tiny room with a little bit of floor where you can walk maybe two steps. And you have a cabinet to keep all your clothes in. And if you're lucky, you might have a tiny window. Uh, depending on where you are on the ship. When you want to go to the bathroom, you can get out of bed and walk a few steps to the bathroom, and here it is. And see, if you can see it, the edge of the toilet and a tiny little shower there that you have to turn sideways to get into. And usually these bathrooms would be shared by two bedrooms like this. So four scientists are all uh, sharing one bathroom. But it works out okay. And in fact, when we're doing science on the ship, we're taking samples from the deck of the ship into the ocean. And this work goes on 24 hours a day. So you sleep when you can. Sometimes you're sleeping in the middle of the afternoon because you're going to be up all night. And it just depends on uh, what's happening on the ship. Um, now, the nice thing is that everybody gets to eat together. You can see down here on the lower left, this is a dining room, which on a ship is called a mess. That's it. It's not really messy, but it's called a mess. And um, so people uh, can eat here. And uh, the total number of people on this ship might be, if it's a full ship, about 60. And sometimes there's some spare time and you can go sit in the lounge and read or listen to music or watch movies. So uh, it's a pretty nice atmosphere and everybody uh, cooperates with each other. It's generally quite fun. Let's go back to the map for a second. The thing I wanted to emphasize is that Antarctica has been melting the ice on Antarctica has been melting more than usual for quite a few years, since maybe about the time your parents were kids. Now, this map is showing, don't worry about the middle for now, see the red dots around the edge? The bigger red dots have a little line pointing to individual ice shelves, and the red color indicates that all of these ice shelves are melting. All of these ice shelves are melting more than usual in the last few decades. 
There are some over here in East Antarctica that are melting less than usual. But what this means is that the ice from the middle is flowing to the edges faster than it did, let's say, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. And it flows onto the ice shelves and the ice shelves are getting thinner and they're flowing faster. So if you look at a blow up right here, this blue box, and go over to the right, now I've shown a magnified view of that. And the colors here are not real colors. The colors are representing how fast the ice is flowing into the ocean, which is shown in white here. So you can see all of this is continental ice and ice can flow. It flows. Imagine if you put peanut butter in the fridge and then you put it on a spoon and then you left the spoon in the glass and you came back maybe half an hour or an hour later, you would find that the peanut butter had flowed, it warmed up and flowed off of the spoon maybe and partly into the glass. You've done that. And glacial ice is a little bit similar. It can actually flow even though we think of ice cubes as very hard and crystalline. So the ice flows into the ocean and it's flowing faster and faster into these ice shelves and the ice shelves are getting thinner as well. And the result of that is that this whole process moves ice from the continent into the ocean where it melts and that causes the whole level of the ocean to rise up a little bit. This is called sea level rise. And sea level is rising right now as the global climate gets warmer. Right now, I just saw an article on my phone last night that given the temperatures that we've had up until this month, April, it looks like 2019 might be the warmest year ever on the surface of the Earth um, since we've been taking measurements of temperature for the last 100 years or so. Now, the reason that this warming is happening is because uh, all of us, us humans, your parents and your grandparents have been burning oil and gasoline for a long time. And when you burn oil and gasoline, you put a gas called carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is what's called a greenhouse gas. And it's called a greenhouse gas because when you have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you trap the Earth's heat into the atmosphere and onto the surface of the Earth. And the Earth can't help but get a little bit warmer all the time. And that is what's causing this increase in the melting in the Antarctic. So let's look at this idea of ice shelves for a minute, where the continental ice, the glacier, meets the ocean. So here is a cross section. This picture is like if you took a cake and made a slice down through it. We made a vertical slice through the edge of Antarctica here, and all the light blue is ice. And off to the left, out of sight, is the rest of Antarctica and all the glacial ice cap. And to the right here is the ocean. All the dark blue is ocean water. And this is showing how the ocean water interacts with the ice. Now we know that the ice is flowing. It's always flowing towards the sea. Um, and when the ice flows, it makes this shelf, which is floating on the ocean. And underneath the shelf is this area, which is called the ice shelf cavity. Cavity, just like you get a cavity in your tooth. It's an area underneath the ice shelf. Now, the way these ice shelves are thinning and the melting is happening is two different ways. The first way, the most important way, is that warm water from the deep ocean comes up onto the continental shelf here. This is ocean sediment and rocks down here in brown. And it runs along the bottom. And then it gets into the cavity and it meets the glacial ice. Now, the glacial ice is very cold. The water is warm. It's not warm for you and me, but for Antarctica, it's warm. It's about maybe three degrees Fahrenheit above the freezing point. And so it melts the ice slowly, but continuously it melts the ice. And that melted ice then becomes liquid water and the liquid water mixes with the seawater and dilutes the saltiness a little bit. And that water becomes lighter and rises up. And then it comes out like this out from underneath the ice shelf. So this is like a pump that continually takes water from beneath and sends it out here. We call this the meltwater pump. Now, the other thing that happens is, especially as the ice shelf gets thinner, it gets faster at breaking off pieces of it. And when you break off a piece of an ice shelf, 
you make an iceberg. You guys probably know what icebergs are. Icebergs are glacial ice that's broken off from a continent somewhere, from an ice shelf, and is now floating in the ocean. It's not the same thing as sea ice, which is shown over here, which is very thin ice, which is actually made in the ocean by freezing the surface of the ocean. Sea ice is made from seawater, and glaciers and icebergs are made from snow that got compressed into ice on a continent. Okay, so this ice shelf is losing ice by making more icebergs and by melting from beneath. So this cavity is slowly getting bigger and deeper. And this is happening under all the ice shelves around Antarctica and especially in the Amundsen Sea. So what we are studying, the aspect of this process that we're studying is we have a hypothesis that is an educated guess about what is happening that is focused on the chemistry of the seawater. And we're focused on this element iron. Do you know what iron is? You've seen iron objects. Your refrigerator is made of iron, for example. Uh, but iron can be dissolved in seawater, the atoms in seawater. And uh, we're interested in this question of iron and Antarctica, and I'll tell you why in a minute. What we think, our hypothesis, whoops, is that when this warm water flows in, it has low iron concentrations, but when it gets into the cavity, it picks up a lot of iron, both iron that's dissolved into the ice that then melts and adds to the ocean water when the ice melts, but also iron from this area right down here, which is where the sediment meets the glacier. And that's called the grounding line. So iron is added and when this water comes back out into the shallow water of the nearby ocean, it has high iron concentrations. Now, why is that important? That's important just because what we call the phytoplankton, which are the plants of the ocean, they uh, have everything they need to grow in this area near Antarctica, except they don't have enough iron. So iron is a nutrient. It's a nutrient for you and for me and for these microscopic cells that are the plants of the ocean. Okay, at the base of the food webs, so everybody else depends on these guys growing. But in general, in the ocean near Antarctica, they don't have enough iron. So it's as if you were growing up as a kid and you never ate green leafy vegetables and you never had meat and uh, you didn't get enough iron in your diet, you would start to get sick. And if you were that way for many years, you might not grow to be as big. You might not grow as quickly. So these phytoplankton are all a little bit stressed because they don't have enough iron. So we're really interested in processes that add iron to the surface ocean here. Why the surface ocean? Because these phytoplankton can only grow in the surface. Why is that? Because that's where the sunlight is. Sunlight can only penetrate a little ways into the oceans. All the phytoplankton grow near the surface. Now you can see in this picture, this is a real picture from where we were in the Amundsen Sea. The ice you see here is sea ice that was formed from seawater and is now floating there. These orange balls are floats on an instrument that we had in the water. And this is really what the water looked like. It's incredibly green. And the reason it's so green is because most of the little microscopic cells there are this organism called Phaeocystis antarctica, a very important um, phytoplankton type species in the um, Antarctic. And this particular species actually often grows as colonies. So what you see in this picture, every little dot there is a cell, an individual plant-like phytoplankton cell, and they're all growing in cooperation in a colony, and they're stuck together in, by sort of a mucus ball, like a little ball of snot, just like that. They're stuck together with snot, and they love living in the snot, and they help each other out, and they make sure they're not eaten by joining together. There are other species, many species that grow here. Here's one example of a different type. Oops, we have a visitor. This is a, this is a higher organism, sorry. She's very curious about what we're doing. Um, this one is called Carithron, and this is a diatom. Now, with your naked eye, if you took a bottle of seawater, this colony is pretty big, and so is this particular diatom. So you could see them as tiny, tiny specks with your naked eye. 
But both of these detailed shots are with the microscope. Okay, so the point is that the phytoplankton need iron. In general, around Antarctica, they don't have enough iron. And so we're really interested in how the ice shelves and the meltwater pump might add iron to the surface water near here. So here we are in the ship. What you see here, this wall of ice, it's really impressive to see up close. This is the face of one of the ice shelves in the Amundsen Sea. In the map on the lower left, this is called the Dotson Ice Shelf. And the ice shelf ends right here at the ocean. All the black stuff is ocean water in this picture. And this face right here is what we're seeing from our ship. And the face of ice is about 60 meters high here. So it's really maybe, um, uh, this is getting close to 200 feet high. So this is many houses tall. And beneath the water, it goes much, much further. And, um, and that is the face of the ice shelf. And then underneath all of this is the ocean. Remember, there's a cavity under here that goes maybe many tens of miles underneath. All of this is seawater underneath. Now in this satellite photo, you can see all the black is seawater. This particular open water that's surrounded by the sea ice over here is called a polynia. It's an area of open water surrounded by ice on all sides, sort of like a lake, but it's seawater. Okay, so how do we measure iron in the water? If we want to know, does this process add iron to the water? We have to be able to measure iron in the water. So this is how we do it in oceanography. We have some very basic tools. And this one you see, see the ice shelf in the back, ice shelf face in the background. Every once in a while, by the way, an iceberg, a small one usually will break off the face here. And uh, we saw this happening when we were there and just a big piece of ice falls into the ocean and makes a big splash and then a wave comes towards the boat from that. So it's a little bit dangerous to be this close to the ice shelf in case a big piece breaks off. Anyway, this is called a CTD rosette, called a rosette because it's got these gray tubes, these water sampling bottles that are in kind of the shape of a, a rose, like petals on a rose. And in this case, there are 12 of these sampling bottles, and they're just like long gray plastic tubes with a cap on each end, and the cap is held open on the bottom and the top. And so what we do is we lower this into the ocean. You can see the rosette here on the deck, and here's our team of, of uh, scientists, chemists, getting ready to put this into the water. We lower this whole thing down to the bottom, right down to the mud at the bottom, of the ocean could easily be a mile down and it gets lowered down on a long cable. So we have a lot of cable on the ship to lower this down. And when we get to the bottom, we start pulling it slowly back up and we decide at what depth we want to catch samples. And when we get to the first depth we want to get a sample, we send an electric signal down the cable and it closes the top and the bottom of the bottle and traps the water at that depth. Then we pull this up a little bit more to the next depth we want to sample and we trip the next bottle or close the next bottle. And by the time we get it up to the surface, we've collected layer by layer all of the samples we want to at 12 different depths. And then, oh, I didn't say that um, to measure the iron, we have to take the water out of here, put it in specially prepared bottles and preserve the seawater with some acid and ship it back to the lab at Rutgers University in New Jersey where we measure the, the iron and several other metals that you've heard of, like copper, zinc, lead, nickel. We have a whole range of metals that we're interested in, in addition to iron. But we have to measure those in the lab because the instruments that we use, we can't take on the ship. So we ship hundreds and hundreds of samples back to New Jersey to analyze. And sometimes from one cruise, it could take us a year to analyze all of those samples. So when we are in the ocean, what I'm showing here, here's Antarctica again, there's the Antarctic Peninsula to orient you, here's the Amundsen Sea. And this map on the lower left is just a little part of the Amundsen Sea. And down here at the bottom, the white now is of the glacial ice shelves, the gray is rock. So this is part of the continent. And all the blue is the ocean. And the darker blue shows the deeper parts, the lighter blue is the shallower parts. 
<clears throat> and you can see that we have numbered stations. We call them stations, locations where we're going to lower the CTD rosette and collect 12 samples at 12 selected depths. And through this, we begin to get an understanding of what the 3D distribution of iron looks like in the Amundsen Sea. Where is it high concentration? Where is it low concentration? So <clears throat> as an example, let's say we took station 17 here. We might see something like this once we'd analyze the samples in the lab. So what we see on the right here is a, what we call a profile or a vertical profile of iron concentration at one station. So look at this for a minute. It's an easy chart to understand because it's set up sort of like the ocean is. The top of the chart is the ocean surface. And as you go down, these numbers are indicating meters of depth down to 800 meters. Okay, 800 meters is, uh, oh, it's about a half a mile deep. And over here on the horizontal, Axis. This is showing us how much iron there are. Don't worry about the units. It's nanomoles of iron per liter. So this is a very low concentration. There is not much iron in the ocean, and it's difficult to measure. So each of the dots here represents one water sampling bottle. Remember, we said we started down here. We trip one bottle here. We trip another one there. There's another one there, another one there. We get to the surface. We label all the bottles for the depths, we bring them back to the lab, we measure the iron, and then we get the answer for each of these stations. And here's what it looks like. We just connect the dots, just like one of those fun drawings you do where you connect the dots, and we measure the iron at each of the dots, and we assume the concentration varies like this between the dots. We don't know that that's true because we didn't take any samples here, but. Um, science has a lot of guesswork, and so we only have 12 bottles, and so we have to decide where to trip them. We can't measure the iron at every single depth. So we have a profile like this for each of these stations, and then we can start to look at, well, how does the iron vary horizontally? We can go from this station to that station to that station along a line of stations and describe what the iron distributions are in the Amundsen Sea. So this is what we've been doing. And the short story is that our hypothesis is partly proven to be true, that when this warm water comes out from the ice shelf cavities, it does carry higher concentrations of iron. And we think that that is fertilizing the phytoplankton that grow in this area and causing them to grow better, that is, they grow faster. And we think that that might have been increasing over the whole time of this increased melting of Antarctica since your parents were kids. Now we're limited here because on a ship we can only take so many samples and we get a rough idea of what the iron distribution looks like, but we can't sample everywhere. And we're only in this area for maybe three weeks. And so we go there, let's say, I did the summer, which would be, let's say January, because we're in the Southern Hemisphere, the calendar is slipped, height of summer is in January instead of July. And um, let's say we can only go there in three weeks in January, so we have no idea really what happened in December or November or what happens in February and March. And does the iron change concentrations? Does the water move around? Um, it's difficult to say without having a ship go there all the time. And that is just too much of a, an expensive endeavor to do. So what do we do? Oh, first of all, let's go back and remind ourselves why this iron addition is important. Well, we think if the ice shelf melting fertilizes the seawater with this extra nutrient iron, which the phytoplankton are all wanting very much, then the climate warming that's going on right now that's causing increased melting of <clears throat> the Antarctic ice may be disturbing the ecosystem in the ocean. Well, the ecosystem is all the interconnected animals and plants that grow together and interact with each other. And all of them depend on the phytoplankton. So if we change the phytoplankton, we may be changing the whole ecosystem. And we're trying to understand in what ways that happens. And it's possible that more phytoplankton, or faster growing phytoplankton, might be good for the ecosystem. It might be bad for the ecosystem. 
And we're beginning to see signs of change in Antarctica over the last few decades. For example, big changes in the populations of penguins. Some species of penguins are de decreasing and others are increasing. Okay, so going back to what I was saying before, and we're almost done now, is we can only measure in so many places in the ocean. So if we wanna find out what's happening in the wider Amundsen Sea over time, we uh, can make a computer model. So this is a simulation using a computer that can help us understand where the iron goes after it's added to the ocean. So we've created this kind of model. The model, of course, is just a representation of reality. So if you have a model airplane, it might have two wings and it might show uh, the body and the, the tail, but it might not fly and you might not have all the details in that model, but it's an approximation of the real airplane. So this is an approximation through a computer of the real ocean. And what we see here, this bay is the Amundsen Sea. I don't know if you can see it, but there are some black lines, especially these black lines here. That's the edge of the continental shelf. And beyond that, up in here, it gets much deeper. Down here, the white line is the edge of all the ice shelves. So you can see, I'm moving my pointer now to all the ice shelves that are fringing the Amundsen Sea. So these are all ice shelves where the glaciers come from Antarctica and are running into the Amundsen Sea. Um, it's a huge area of catching melting glacial ice. What I'm going to show you here in a little movie is what the computer model is telling us is happening with that meltwater that's coming out from the ice shelves. And this will tell us where the meltwater and where the iron, whoopsie, sorry, let me try that again, where the iron is going. So look carefully. The blue is lower concentrations. As we get to red, we get to higher concentrations. Look at all of the iron coming out from all of these ice shelves. And where does it go? It's actually flowing along the coast here and making swirly bits of high iron water that go out away from the coast. Let's look at that again for a second. And so this computer model is telling us that, um, and by the way, our data are in this model. So we are setting up the model based on our data is telling us that the iron is coming out from the ice shelves and is going out into the Amundsen Sea. But first it's going along the coast in this coastal current. Now what you just saw was one year compressed into a few seconds. So let's go, if we now let the model run as if time is running continuously for four more years and then do another year, that's what we're gonna see next. So look at this, we're starting off the fifth year now and already see all the red and the yellow, these are the high concentrations of meltwater with the iron that it's carrying and it's accumulated, especially in the western part of the Amundsen Sea here. And if we run that more, isn't this cool? You can see all the swirly water. And some of this high iron water goes out into the ocean beyond the Amundsen Sea. Over here, you can see the low iron water is coming into the Amundsen Sea. And so this whole portion has lower iron and this has higher iron. But the only place where we've sampled is right in here during three weeks in 2011. 2010 and 11. So that's all we know from our data. This is all a simulation of what we might expect. So this model is a further hypothesis that we can test. And right now I'm hoping to get some funding from the National Science Foundation to go back to the Amundsen Sea and do more sampling of iron and other metals and see if this model is telling us the truth or not. So what are we doing? In the future of this field, well, the big question is, will West Antarctica completely melt into the ocean at some point in the future? Um, that we'll have a question about that, and I'll try and answer it in the question period. Now, this isn't the first time that Antarctica has undergone major melting. When the last ice age ended, starting about 20,000 years ago, there was a huge amount of melting of Antarctica. And so we're very interested in whether the melting that's happening now is similar what happened in the past. And we make analogies between the two processes. And then finally, for the phytoplankton and for the food web, once again, if this iron addition makes more phytoplankton, but also makes the phytoplankton cells start to grow fast earlier in the spring, 
then what are the effects on all the sea animals that for hundreds and thousands of years have gotten used to the phytoplankton hitting their peak at a certain point in the summer? Now they're peaking earlier. What will that happen? What will uh, effects will that have on all the other animals that need to feed on the phytoplankton or that feed on small organisms that themselves feed on? So the timing of the growth of the phytoplankton, we think, is really important to the ecosystem. So finally, just the final message is all of the sea life that you see here, and we can talk about these more in the questions if you like, depends on the phytoplankton at the base of the food web in Antarctica, and the phytoplankton depend on the iron, and the iron supply depends on the melting of the glaciers, the melting of the ice shelves. So that's the simple two sentence summary if you want to remember the talk. So thank you very much and I'm very happy to take questions now. So Rob, you can go to your Google Doc and, and read some of whichever questions you want there. Rob, you muted yourself by accident. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So we'll start at the top here with a question from Maya, age 11, from North Plainfield. And Maya wants to know, because of global warming, do you have an idea about how detrimental rising sea could, the rising sea could be? Yes, we have a pretty good idea about how detrimental that could be. And it looks like the rising sea levels by the time you kids are adults and by the time you are grandparents, the sea level might be quite a bit higher than it is now. When I say quite a bit higher, it's difficult to predict exactly, but it might be, let's say, if you were very old, in 80 years, 80 years plus Maya, so you would be 91. I'm sure you'll be easily be 91 years old. When you're 91, it'll be 2000, it'll be to the year 2100. And we think the sea level might be about a meter higher than it is now. It might be only half a meter, or it might be more than a meter. A meter is a little more than three feet. So if you imagine, that doesn't sound like very much. But if you think about sea level rise at the edges of all the continents where a lot of people live, for example, in New York City or in New Jersey, uh, this would be a huge effect because it would flood a lot of the coastal lands. And especially during storms, the combination of sea level plus storms can do a lot of damage, just like in Superstorm Sandy, if you know about that, a number of years ago, there was a lot of damage around the New Jersey, New York area. So the damage would be similar to that, but worse because the sea level would be higher uh, at, at its base level. So this is a big problem. It could be quite detrimental and it's something that um, we're going to have to deal with very seriously in the coming years. Okay, uh, let's see, we have a lot of questions from Mary and Scotch Plains. Uh, uh, I'll pick out a few of them now because we've got some other questions beneath. Uh, what types of ships can travel to Antarctica? That's the first one. Well, I showed you a picture of a research ship. There are also these days a lot of tourist ships that go to Antarctica. They just... Hi, everybody. This is Rob Shirell back again with questions about Antarctica. Uh, so we had a technical glitch a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna pick up with um, uh, additional questions. What we were talking about, the first question I got to, I think the only one I got to was what types of ships travel to Antarctica. And there was a follow-up question that, to that as well, which is, do they have to be icebreakers? And they don't have to be, there are different classes of ships. Um, you can go to Antarctica on a sailboat. In fact, once I was on one of my trips, I ran into two French retired gentlemen and they had um, sailed their sailboat, not a very big one, maybe 32 feet from South America to Antarctica. And they were on the adventure of their lives. And it was a fiberglass sailboat and they were being careful 
Um, and I hope they got back fine as well. So you can get to Antarctica on a small boat if you're very adventurous and you're prepared for um, emergencies. Um, so they don't have to be icebreakers. Even icebreakers have different classes of icebreaker. Um, most of the tourist boats are not icebreakers. They are called ice strengthened hulls. So they are somewhat stronger, especially in the bow but they don't have the capability to actually break through thick sea ice. And even icebreakers have different capabilities. Um, and the research boats that I've been on, that the science is done from, are sort of the lowest class of icebreaker. So it's possible for them to get stuck in the ice. And in fact, the photo I showed of the Palmer, surrounded by sea ice, if you remember, with people walking around it, on the sea ice that was actually from a period when the palmer got stuck in sea ice uh, and couldn't move and was stuck there for about two weeks and eventually the wind changed and blew the sea ice and broke it up and the ship was able to get out the strongest icebreakers are are nuclear powered and they're extremely strong and can move at quite a fast rate through ice that's maybe uh six feet thick or eight feet thick and chunks of ice go flying off the bows. Chunks, these chunks of ice are like the size of school buses. And uh, they're con constantly flying out of the way in the bow as the, as the ship plows through the ice. I've never been on an icebreaker that strong before. Um, one of the, the next question was, how do you get rock and ice samples back from Antarctica? Well, I have uh, most, as most of what I'm getting back is um, seawater samples and sometimes sediment, mud from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, certainly rock and ice samples are shipped back as well, and they're shipped either on, on our cargo vessels, first the research ship and then transferred to a cargo vessel. That's the most common way. If they are frozen samples, then they need to be shipped by air. And so they're brought back in a freezer compartment on the research ship to South America or sometimes to New Zealand. And then they're packed into another freezer container, which goes on a an airplane and are flown back to the U.S. That way. Most of the samples come by ship into a port near San Diego in the U.S. And, that, and then from there, we ship the samples from San Diego back to the lab. So it can sometimes take six months before between the crews and the time the samples arrive in our lab in New Jersey. So we always have multiple projects going and we work on some other project while we wait for the samples to arrive. Uh, have you ever found fossils in Antarctica? This is still Mary from Scotch Plains. Um, the only fossils that I've seen are fossils, micro fossils that are preserved in the mud at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and those are fossils of the shells of little organisms. Um, and those are certainly there. Others have found fossils in Antarctica on the land. Uh, there was a time in Antarctica's history when it was warm or warm-ish and especially around the edges, had um, vascular plants, meaning regular plants like we see around us and trees. And uh, evidence of this occasionally turns up. But it's very difficult evidence to find because most of it is covered by a lot of glacial ice. So with the melting of the ice, new areas of ice-free Antarctica, especially around the edges, have been exposed and new fossils have been found just in the last 10 years in those areas. Um, are there commercial mineral deposits there? There are certainly mineral deposits that could be exploited, but it's outlawed by the International Antarctic Treaty. There is no commercial exploitation of Antarctica allowed under that treaty. And it's quite strongly enforced. And if anybody tried to break it, like set up a camp and start mining in Antarctica, I think the activity would be uh, seen and international law would come into play. So there is no, uh, there are essentially no business ventures in Antarctica. Um, what new tool or device would you like to invent for your research? Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. Uh, I have been thinking about a sophisticated water sampling tool that operates from a drone. Uh, or could operate from an automated uh, submarine called a glider that works in the ocean. And that would allow us to get samples in places where it's difficult to get to. 
um, in Antarctica. You can't go everywhere in a ship, but potentially you, in the future, you could fly a long distance drone to those places and have the drone touch down and sample in the surface water and then take off and sample in another place, et cetera, before returning to, for example, Palmer Station, um, a research station. So I have in my head a design for a miniaturized water sampling device that would take many, maybe 50 water samples uh, on each voyage or, or trip of a, a drone or an automated submarine. So I've been thinking about that, whether that will actually come about. Other people are working on those ideas as well. So I'm not the only one. Do the ice samples have any meteorite samples in them? You know, there are meteorites in Antarctica, and it's actually one of the most successful places to go searching for meteorites. I think you may hear more about that uh, in an upcoming Ask a Geologist on June 2nd, I believe it is. There is a whole program about meteorites, and you'll hear more about that. But the short answer is that meteorites do fall in Antarctica. They're no more common. They don't arrive, you know, fall from the sky to Antarctica any more than they fall to New Jersey, but it is easier to find them. Part of the reason is that you have black meteorites against uh, white snow and ice, and so the contrast makes it easier to find as opposed to, for example, going out in a, in a farmer's field and looking for meteorites. They're certainly there, but um, most of them are small and they don't look that different from the rocks that are in the soil anyway, so it's hard to find them. In Antarctica, there are several reasons why it's easier to find a, a meteorites. But it's a very adventurous thing to do because it requires living for weeks in a tent in certain areas in Antarctica that are very cold and very windy. And um, nevertheless, there is a meteorite hunting expedition that happens at least once a year. Um, let's see, question about ice samples and Earth's magnetic field, whether the magnetic field gets recorded in ice samples. And the answer, as far as I know, maybe somebody else can chime in, one of my colleagues can chime in at some point here, but uh, no, the Earth's magnetic field is, does not get recorded in ice. However, lots of other things do. The follow-up question was, is there iron dust in ice? And there certainly is, because dust from dry, arid areas of the continents blows all over the globe. And some of it, a small amount of it, lands in Antarctica. And people have studied this, have taken ice cores from near the South Pole and other areas and measured the amount of dust and how much iron it contains. And this dust is mostly coming from Patagonia, the southern tip of South America, and from Africa and Australia. Um, so there is iron dust in the ice. And in fact, when I talked about the iron being added to the seawater in the ice shelf cavities, part of that iron is dissolving out dissolving of iron dust that is entombed within the glacial ice that only gets released when the ocean water melts that glacial ice. And that glacial ice, by the time it reaches the edge of the continent, some of that glacial ice might be as much as a million years old. So the ice at the bottom of the pile of ice in Antarctica in places fell as snow up to a million years ago. And that eventually flows to the edges of the continent and could be part of uh, what you find in an ice shelf. So yes, there's iron dust and ice. Uh, we think based on the data that we have so far that the iron that gets added to the water is not mostly from that glacial ice, but is actually from what I, if you remember what I called the grounding line and the sediment right where the glacier meets the mud within the cavity. That that sediment releases iron, the iron gets into the mixture of seawater and meltwater. Because that is more buoyant, it rises up underneath the ceiling of the ice shelf, if you like, and then comes out at a shallow depth where it can supply iron to the phytoplankton on the surface. So that's a way of getting sediment sourced iron up into the upper water column, call it the water column. The upper water column is where the phytoplankton grow. Without the meltwater happening, you wouldn't have the buoyancy to get that 
water that's in contact with the sediments up to the surface. There is no mechanism for mixing that very deep water up to the surface. Um, we have another question here. How does the water in the oceans move around Antarctica? So that's a great question. We have something called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the ACC. And the ACC is a big donut of ocean that moves from west to east and continually circles around Antarctica. And um, uh, this is the actually the largest ocean current in the world by far. It carries a lot of water very fast around Antarctica, spinning constantly. And uh, this is a really important aspect of the Earth's climate because that ocean water interacts with the atmosphere above it. And between the two of them, they kind of make a thermal boundary between Antarctica and the rest of the world. And they prevent too much heat getting from the tropical areas down to Antarctica. And that's part of what keeps the Antarctic continent so cold and keeps the ice cap intact. Is the water the same chemistry all around Antarctica? Absolutely not. Um, and that is actually part of what we are really interested in studying, chemistry of the water and how it interacts with the living organisms in the water. So uh, we've sampled only a tiny amount of the water around Antarctica, so we don't have a very good answer to that question. Uh, there's some aspects of the chemistry, like how much total salt is in the water, the salinity that we know much better than, for example, how much iron is there. And that's simply because we can measure the salt content, the salinity automatically on the CTD every second as we lower the CTD down and bring it up. And so a lot of CTDs have been deployed around Antarctica over the last oh, 50 years or so. And uh, we have a good idea of the distribution of salinity. But only recently and using special precautions and special tools have we been able to measure iron. So my lab at Rutgers is one of a relatively small number of labs around the world that's very good at measuring these tiny amounts of iron in the water. And we're catching up. So we haven't done the kind of sampling, special sampling gear to sample for iron. So we have a much, we're still very much in an exploratory mode with respect to iron. Um, let's see, when will all the ice melt? Well, that's a really good question. We think that there has been ice on Antarctica, quite a, you know, some size of ice cap for maybe something like the last 34 million years. So it takes a long time to develop the ice. It takes a long time to melt it all. But in that question, there's a real difference between West Antarctica, and that's the part of Antarctica that is mostly below sea level, and East Antarctica that's mostly above sea level. And uh, the concern right now is that, that West Antarctica is melting faster and faster, and it is possible to get a runaway situation where we can't reverse and the only thing that can happen is continued melting and that eventually all of West Antarctica will melt. East Antarctica, Antarctica will probably stay intact for a long, long time. Now, how long will it take for West Antarctica to melt? People are working on that question. A lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, taking a little bit of melting now and trying to extrapolate into the future. Uh, but we're talking about hundreds and hundreds to thousands of years. So it won't be very soon, we think, um, but it might be soon enough to uh, affect the lives of our um, not too distant progeny. Even in a couple of hundred years, enough melting might happen that, um, that sea level could rise considerably, um, many meters. And this would be devastating for the distribution of life around uh, on the continents right now of human life. Um, we would need to have some severe adaptation or moving away from the coasts in order to accommodate that. Will the land bounce up after the ice is gone? Absolutely. Um, the weight of part of the reason that West Antarctica, the continent is below sea level now is because the weight of all that ice has sat on that continent for enough millions of years 
that it's actually pressed the continental rock a little bit deeper into the mantle of the earth. And when you remove the ice, removing all that weight um, means that that piece of continent bounces back. It, bouncing is maybe a bad term because it, it rebounds very slowly. This is called isostatic rebound. And um, at the fastest that that happens, for example, some places on the coast of Norway, over the course of a person's life, they might see that uh, a rock that used to be below sea level, that, or let's say a boulder the size of a person, uh, is now completely out of the water. So that could be a, a meter or two of rebound over, let's say, 50 years. Um, so this would, uh, Antarctica would definitely rise up. It would take a long, long time, and that's a whole other set of predictions to understand how long it would take. There's an interesting related phenomenon, and that is, has to do with gravity. And when we talk about sea level, and sea level going up because of Antarctic melting, well, sea level rise, you would think that all the water just adds to the ocean. The ocean level evens out everywhere, and the sea level rises in equal amount everywhere. But it turns out not to be true. And part of the reason that some areas of the ocean rise more than others is because of gravitational effects, small difference in, differences in the gravitational field of the Earth, and the gravity of large masses of land and ice on the Earth. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but if all of the ice in Antarctica melted, yes, the sea level would go up, but it wouldn't go up near Antarctica as much as it would go up elsewhere. The reason for that is that right now, all of that ice in Antarctica has a gravitational pull of its own. Gravity is a force associated with any object that has mass, and there's a lot of mass in Antarctic ice. So right now, Antarctica, because of its own gravity, is pulling the ocean water towards it ever so slightly. So sea level is slightly higher around Antarctica than it is in some other places in the ocean. So if that ice all melted and went away, you wouldn't have that mass anymore, and that effect of pulling the sea level towards Antarctica would diminish. Okay, let's get on to we have a, just a handful of other questions here. Um, if the Antarctic Treaty <clears throat> didn't exist, will it be possible to develop it and have big cities like we have here? Here, I think that means the U.S. and New Jersey, for example. And in theory, yes, that would be possible. And it's not uh, completely crazy to think that cities might have been developed if there hadn't been an Antarctic Treaty. Probably that would have only happened if there had been a reason to be in Antarctica for, um, for example, exploiting minerals, um, doing mining, or doing some other economic activity, or if setting up fishing or something like that. Certainly small <clears throat> uh, villages have been set up in Antarctica in the past. Um, I don't know, maybe camps is a better word for the purposes of whaling. So in the early part of the 20th century, the late 19th century, uh, whaling camps were set up to process whale meat, and it was a big industry. And in fact, many of the whales around Antarctica were killed at that time. And they've been slowly coming back ever since. So there has been a little bit of sort of population of small villages, I would say, along the edges of Antarctica. It's a very difficult place to build a city because it's mostly ice. There's some exposed areas of rock, so you'd have to probably build your city right on the edge of the continent in one of those exposed areas, and there are not very many of them. Um, the, the U.S. research stations on the edge are built in the relatively ice-free areas. Because to build something on ice, it's a very unstable surface, surface, and you have to rebuild it all the time because the ice is moving all the time, slowly. So um, I personally am glad that we don't have big cities in Antarctica. It's an absolutely beautiful place to visit and to see raw nature completely undeveloped. Um, it's amazing how beautiful it can be when you don't have green colors and you don't have fall colors. All you have is varying shades of white and gray and black when you see rock. 
Um, but it's incredibly beautiful. I hope it stays that way for a long time. Okay, Ria's mom asked the question, has calving ever happened or ever caused a tsunami to occur and can it happen? Well, it can happen. And in fact, tsunami is not quite the right term probably because a tsunami is usually created by an earthquake under the ocean where the seafloor shifts. Um, a big area of the seafloor sinks or rises up by maybe a meter or something like that, and that causes a huge change in, in the height of the whole ocean water column. And that's a very powerful event, and it can create a, a wave that can travel all the way across the ocean. That can't happen with a glacier calving because it's not nearly as much mass that's moving, but it can be quite big. In fact, there was a time, I have some movies of it um, somewhere, when the Palmer, the ship that I was on, that I showed you a picture of, was close to an ice shelf face, like the ones I showed you a picture of, and a big calving of that happened to occur right then, where a big piece of the ice shelf um, cracked and fell off. And the ship was only maybe uh, two football fields away, and the wave that was generated was large enough to completely flood the aft deck and to throw pieces of ice the size of refrigerators onto the aft deck. And fortunately, people saw it coming and ran off the aft deck and got inside the inner structure of the ship and nobody was hurt. But um, some of the equipment on the aft deck was uh, completely ruined uh, by being bashed by these huge pieces of ice. So it can certainly happen, at least in a local way. And uh, ships, since that event, <laughs> the U.S. ships are not allowed to uh, approach within a certain distance of an ice shelf face or even an iceberg out in the ocean. In fact, I've seen it happen that a large iceberg will sometimes crack and split in two. And when that happens, often the iceberg can rotate in the water, sometimes 90 degrees. So then you might have the small tip of the iceberg above the ocean, but when it rotates, the much bigger bottom part can come up to the surface and um, can hit a ship from underneath when that happens. So it's important to stay away from these areas and make sure everybody stays safe. Fortunately, the, the safety on US research ships has an excellent record. Um, Lauren Barron wanted to know, how do you obtain permission to perform research or navigate areas occupied by other countries? That's a really good question. <clears throat> so this is all governed by the details of the Antarctic Treaty, and I have to admit some of this I'm not very expert on. Um, but there is a lot of cooperative cooperation. For example, nominally, different parts of Antarctica are split into pie wedges that are sort of under the, not the control, but under the stewardship of different countries. And uh, that doesn't really mean too much um, in terms of who can go where. So we have always been able to sample in waters around Antarctica that are nominally under the stewardship of another country. And those agreements are preset within the portions of the Antarctic Treaty. So generally speaking, there is not a big problem with traveling around Antarctica or onto the continent in order to perform um, research. It's probably one of the best operating treaties in the world, frankly. And generally speaking, except for violation of the prohibition on fishing, is probably the biggest problem, the biggest violation of the treaty. That's, and it's not possible to enforce all of that because you can't have, uh, you know, international police boats everywhere in Antarctica. It's a very difficult place to get to and expensive to get to. The final question is, how did you decide to become a geologist, geologist and an oceanographer? And other than Antarctica, where else has your career taken you? Oh, that's a funny question. I had a circuitous route, route to becoming an oceanographer. Um, I think it started when I was in junior high school. I had a summer job off the coast of Massachusetts, and that job was harvesting seaweed. And it was called uh, Irish moss, this type of seaweed. And it was used commercially. We sold it to a company that dried it out and then sold it to another company and they extracted carrageenan from it. Carrageenan is a, it's a stabilizer for emulsion. So it's used in 
shaving cream and food like Cool Whip and things like that. And at the time, it was mostly extracted from the seaweed. So that was kind of like a, a, a summer job. And we'd go out on boats at low tide, small boats and along the coast. And we had long rakes, 16 foot long rakes with big bronze heads on them. And we'd scrape the seaweed off the rocks and into the boat. And then when we got to shore after several hours of this work, we would sell it to the manager and he would weigh it all and we'd get paid three quarters of a cent per pound. So, um, but through that experience, I learned to just love being on the ocean in a boat. And I think that stuck with me, but it wasn't until after college, uh, well after college that I decided to try to become an oceanographer. I was initially a biochemist and working in a physiology lab at medical school at Columbia University. And I enjoyed that. But after a couple of years, I decided it wasn't my cup of tea. And I tried to join my interest in the ocean with my interest in chemistry. I got another job as a technician at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is part of Columbia University, located on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, right on the New Jersey, New York border in Rockland County. And um, so I was there for two years working as a technician and decided that I had a chance to go on a couple of research cruises that I really liked this field. And then I applied to graduate school and eventually got my uh, PhD at MIT and um, was able to become a professional oceanographer. And that's what I've been doing now for quite a few years. And I've been had a great chance to go many places with this job for field work, uh, for international meetings. So my career has taken me, as I said, to all um, seven continents. Um, I was not too long ago in China giving a series of talks and interacting with Chinese colleagues on ships. I've been across the Atlantic Ocean. I've been across a good part of the Pacific Ocean. I've never been on a ship in the Arctic Ocean, but somebody from my research group did go on a ship on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, I've been in the Mediterranean. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I guess that's that's about it. A 30 research cruises. A number of those cruises have been not on the ocean, but actually in Lake Superior for a while. I was studying the chemistry of Lake Superior, the largest lake in North America, which in some ways is kind of uh, like an ocean. And so I could apply the tools that I know to study of that lake. I've gotten a chance to go to lots of different places and to spend some time living in other places doing science uh, during academic sabbaticals. So it's been, it's a fantastic job to become a scientist and to have the capability to travel and especially to get to know people in other cultures working on similar related topics, but from a different point of view. And uh, this is a really a chance to enrich your life and to open you up and make your brain more flexible. So that I am very grateful. And I think that's about the end of the questions. Um, again, sorry for the technical glitch and I'm glad you were all able to tune in and I appreciate you listening to the talk and I hope you'll continue to um, tune into these uh, Ask a Geologist sessions uh, and, uh, until the end, which is in June sometime. So thanks a lot and talk to you later.